Hey you guys, welcome back to Flickers of Fear. So you guys know that I was going to get around to this one sooner rather than later because if you've been around here for any length of time, uh, I reviewed the novel that this was based on and I loved it uh, probably like several months ago. And not too long ago, if you uh, go over to my Scare Salon channel, I also picked this novel as one of my favorite horror novels of the 21st century so far. And that novel, of course, is Grady Hendrix's My Best Friend's Exorcism, which came out in 2016, and it is an amazing novel if you haven't read it. So when I found out that Amazon Studios was making a film adaptation of it, I was kind of like, I don't know. I don't know how I felt. I was kind of like cautiously excited, but also had a lot of trepidation because I was pretty sure, like just the way that the book is, I was pretty sure that any movie version of this novel was going to not live up to, because I mean, it would be hard to because the novel is so good. I mean, the novel is just this brilliantly realized, perfect balance of horror, like grotesque body horror, as well as like actual scary shit with comedy. Like, you know, it's also funny and it also is genuinely heartfelt. Like so much so, I think I mentioned this on my book review that um, I actually kind of like teared up at the end because the end was like kind of bittersweet. So I felt like all of that stuff that I loved about the book, I didn't think they were going to be able to, you know, kind of mimic it in any meaningful way on screen because I just kind of feel like the constraints of the movie were probably just too, just, I don't know. It, it just, I didn't think they'd be able to replicate it. And it actually makes me a little bit sad to say this, but my suspicions about the movie adaptation were mostly correct. And I'm not saying this is a bad movie. It's not, um, it is like a really fun, just kind of like entertaining little slice of eighties retro awesomeness. It has like some rad tunes in it, culture club, aha, stuff like that. And uh, very, very amusingly atrocious though period accurate fashions. One of the funniest things in this was that the girl who played Glee uh, was she had these earrings that were like these little fuzzy, I think they were little blue bunny rabbits. And I flipped out because I forgot. I think when, when I was a kid, either I had or my friend had, I can't remember, earrings that were just like that, except they were little brown fuzzy teddy bears, but it looked like the same company made them. And I was like, holy shit, I forgot all about those. So I thought that was like really funny that like one of the girls had those on because I had completely forgotten about that little that little fashion thing there. Uh, so it does have good things about it. I have seen reviews calling it like Stranger Things, but with an exorcism. And that's sort of accurate. I mean, I think Stranger Things is a lot better, but it's kind of like a similar vibe. You know what I mean? So the movie, I kind of feel like while it is fun and it is entertaining, it's mostly just very shallow, which is kind of what I was afraid was gonna happen. And it also leans a lot more heavily on the comedy than it does the horror and tones down the book's gruesomeness pretty significantly because, I mean, the book had some really, really fucked up, uh, like disgusting stuff in it. And this one is just like mildly disgusting. You know what I mean? They did like kind of pull back on the horror a lot, which I think was probably uh, a mistake. Now, just as in the novel, the story revolves around 16 year old Abby Rivers, who is played by Elsie Fisher. Uh, I guess she got a Golden Globe nomination for the 2018 movie Eighth Grade, which I've heard was great, but I haven't seen yet. And the girl that plays like her kind of ride or die best friend, Gretchen Lang, is played by uh, Amaya Miller. And I think she was in, she's been in a few things, but I think she was in uh, War for the Planet of the Apes, like from 2017. She looked familiar, but I couldn't like uh, quite place her. Now, unlike the book, the movie takes place entirely in 1988, when the girls are 16. The novel actually started out in 1982 and took time to like set up the two girls meeting as 10 year olds and kind of delineating their blossoming friendship over the subsequent four years. And then most of the book takes place in 1988. Obviously the movie didn't really have time to do that, but I think it kind of like suffered a little bit as a result. I get that there are time constraints uh, you know, with a movie, obviously, that you don't have with a book, but I kind of feel like that's 
the reason that maybe this book in particular would have made a better series than a standalone film. I mean, I guess that's true of like the majority books of books, really. I, th I feel like the story has so much more impact when you really kind of feel the weight of these two characters long relationship, their long friendship, and they're just like fierce, undying love for one another and loyalty toward one another. It's like it has a lot more impact. And in a movie, you can't really establish that. I mean, you can, but Th this movie didn't really do that, you know what I mean? So the movie jumps pretty quickly into the first inciting incident, which is pretty much the same as it was in the book. You got Abby and Gretchen, the two main characters, and then they have two other, you know, friends slash classmates, their little clique or whatever. Uh, Margaret, he's played by Rachel Ogechi Kanu, and um, Kanu, I guess, and Glee, who's played by Kathy Ang. Uh, they're spending the weekend at Margaret's parents' lake house. And they kind of start fucking around with the Ouija board, and then they drop some acid, which has been brought by Margaret's obnoxious chode of a boyfriend, Wallace, who's played by Clayton Johnson, who's really... <laughs> <laughs> kind of wish he'd gotten killed, but no. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't think he got killed in the book. Yet. I can't remember. Um, so nobody feels any put any like uh, particularly momentous effects from this LSD. So they're all just like, is this even real LSD? Did you like bring us some like bullshit here? But at some point during the night, there's kind of like a little bit of an argument. Abby and Gretchen kind of end up going off by the woods, into the woods like by themselves. And they end up exploring this old abandoned house that's kind of been the subject of like some urban legends about I think it was like about a local girl who was sacrificed or something like that they don't go a huge amount into it into in the movie so the girls are in this house and they hear start hearing like weird noises and they see some kind of like unsettling shit while they're in there although obviously they think well we're just you know we're we're on acid so we're obviously like seeing things but then like something really bad like kind of spooks them and Abby runs off now she thinks that Gretchen is right behind her because there's like you know you're led to believe that like the demon is like making her just like I'm right behind you keep running Abby you know what I mean so it's that kind of thing so she doesn't realize she's not back there Gretchen meanwhile uh, is not actually right behind Abby and is still in the house and she gets kind of like dragged into the darkened bowels of this house by this you know something unseen uh, and but she still hears Abby's voice as though Abby is like in the house and like can't find her she's like Gretchen where are you I'm just right here blah 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 so you know it, it's kind of like set up like that where they get separated so obviously Abby uh, you know comes across the other two girls who have been like looking for them so they go back to the house and they find Gretchen in the house and she's like crying and freaking out uh, they all just think she's tripping balls and she's seeing stuff so they don't really think that much more about it as the story goes on, though, after this incident, uh, it's pretty clear that something terrible happened to Gretchen in that house um, because subsequently she starts to act like completely different. Like before, you know, she had kind of like her Aquanet, her hair game was like totally on point, like her clothes were totally on point. Now she's kind of like neglecting her hygiene and her fashion sense and everything like that. Um, she starts to kind of like go real pale and have the kind of like cold sores on her mouth and stuff. Um, starts like mouthing off to the nuns at their private school, like doing all kind of like rebellious shit. Also, she starts to kind of deliberately try to set her friends against one another by doing shit like planting fake love notes, pretty like very openly flirting with Margaret's boyfriend, like right in front of her, um, and basically like saying really cruel things that target her friend's deepest insecurities. So, you know, she's trying to cause like dissension within the friend group. Now, despite being the butt of Gretchen's, uh, you know, some of her most vicious kind of little uh, machinations or whatever, Abby persists in her efforts to help her best friend. She's really the only one that sticks by her and knows something is the matter and she's going to get to the bottom of it and help her. Um, so she knows obviously that something is wrong, but she doesn't know what, and Gretchen won't really tell her other than just like really, really sketchy details. She starts to suspect, as you probably would in real life, that Gretchen was maybe raped in the abandoned house and is acting up because she's having like PTSD and she can't tell anybody. So since she believes this, she doesn't really want to do it, but she kind of goes behind Gretchen's back, like kind of does an end run around her and tells Gretchen's parents and some of the teachers at school, like what happened. And it's like, you know, hey, she needs some help like that's why she's acting like this but predictably like all the authority figures just much like in the book were all very hypocritical and they kind of just cared more about the fact it's like oh my god Gretchen was doing illegal drugs like more than the fact that you know she'd possibly been attacked and was like experiencing trauma you know what I mean and like I said I lived through the 80s so <laughs> this tracks it that was that was very much probably what would have happened in real life so Abby uh, finally she has no one in her life that she can trust so out of desperation she eventually joins forces with this ridiculous man 
<laughs> this like very like faith based bodybuilder guy uh, named Christopher Lemon. He's played by Chris Lowell. Now he's one of like this trio of brothers who do these really silly like religious revival shows mixed with weightlifting feats. Like, look, we're lifting you know weights for the Lord and shit like that. Um, so they do shows at like private schools and malls and shit. And as I said, I grew up in the '80s. Like I said, I'm, I was about I think I was exactly the same age as these girls would have been like in 1988 because I was in high school in 1988. Um, so having grown up in the 1980s, I didn't go to a private school. I just went to a regular public school. But I do remember these kind of events were kind of a bit of a thing, like at religious schools particularly, because I knew some people that went to religious schools and did these kind of ridiculous, like I said, you know, pumping up your faith kind of. It was always like some kind of stunt, like, you know what I mean, that had to do, but they would like attach Jesus to it. And I remember like the weightlifting ones being like particularly, there was like a lot of those. Now, despite this guy being a complete and total doof who kind of reminds me he kind of reminded me a little bit of like 80s Rob Lowe a little bit like his look I've never he looked kind of familiar so I don't know if I've seen him in anything else like I said um Chris Lowell I, I should have looked him up probably but yeah but I but he just gave me that kind of like Rob Lowe sort of vibe so like I said he's a total dork but um, he is the real thing. Like, he does, when he comes to their school, like, to do the presentation, he sees Gretchen, like, sitting in the crowd and, like, immediately knows that something's wrong with her or she's, like, possessed or whatever. Abby ends up going to him and persuades him to perform an exorcism on her. And he agrees after she is like, well, I'll give you, like, a whole bunch. She works at, like, a yogurt shop. And she's like, I'll give you a bunch of, like, free yogurt punch tickets. And, uh, you know, and, and he kind of wants to take it on, too, because he's never done one before. And he wants to, like, prove to his brothers, I guess, that he's capable of doing it. And I guess, like, their mom died a long time ago, and he has, like, mommy issues. Like I said, they kind of go into it more in the book, but they kind of, like, talk about it in the movie as well. So, as I mentioned, these are all pretty much the exact same plot points from the book. Like, it is a faithful adaptation. I'm not saying that. Like, at least as far as the plot points and the events that happen. But because the film has to, by necessity, compress like, a great deal of the story into its quite short runtime, it's only about 93 minutes, something like that, the whole whole thing kind of felt a little bit rushed to me and so relationships and plot points and things like that aren't really given much room to breathe now maybe it's possible that the movie doesn't feel that way to somebody that hasn't read the novel um you know i i wouldn't know because i read the novel and i read it fairly recently but to me it just did seem like a lot of the narrative was just kind of like skimming the surface of what made the book so special like what made it so good without all of that backstory and build up of Abby and Gretchen's friendship and also to a lesser extent their relationship with Margaret and Glee also like the dynamics of their friend group all you're kind of left with without all of that is just this kind of mildly amusing like 80s set teen comedy really with kind of just like a sprinkling of quite mild horror elements I mean to put that another way there are already lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of exorcism stories so you really need to bring something amazing to the table to make one of them stand out from the pack. Now, Grady Hendrix, who wrote the novel, absolutely did that, um, taking all of these kind of tired exorcism tropes and using them to explore kind of deeper issues, like not only the intensity of teenage female friendships, like the love that develops between them and the loyalty and everything, but also kind of too, like the manner in which girls find themselves and find their own unique power, like as they grow up, it's like a coming of age story. Um, so when you don't have all of that and without all of the emotional investment that you felt with the book characters, which you absolutely do because the characters are just really, really well uh, realized in the book. So without that, um, the movie just seems a little bit like fluff. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's fun fluff. It is very fun and very entertaining. Um, and the two lead actresses are actually great, but I kind of wish they had been given something with a little bit more substance like to work with. I also kind of wish, too, that the movie had tipped the scales more in the direction of horror rather than comedy. I didn't mind the comedy, obviously, because the book was funny, too, but I feel like the horror wasn't horror-y enough. Like, it didn't go far enough, um, because I kind of feel like one of the best things about the book was, like, the juxtaposition between those two things, which was really, really well done. Now, I admit that in the movie, I did laugh out loud at, like, The Exorcist, because he was so ludicrous and yet somehow, like, still kind of lovable, uh, and that was, like, a definite highlight of the movie third act. Um, his character is also hilarious in the book, I might add, and it does translate very well here, like, into the movie. But I felt like I wanted more body horror, like the one in the book, like the thing with the tapeworms, which they get into here, but is not 
nearly as gross as it was in the book. Like, it's hardly gross at all, like, seriously, which kind of, like, bummed me out. Uh, so I wanted more of that body horror, that gruesome. I wanted more creepiness, because the book is actually quite creepy and, like, has some, like, really scary bits in it, even though it's also funny. Um, and I kind of wanted more of a sense of, like, the stakes at play. In the book, you really, because so much time has been spent, like, establishing these characters and getting you really emotionally invested in them, there it, the stakes seem, like, really, really high, and you're really kind of, like, rooting for Abby to be able to save Gretchen, you know what I mean? And because they didn't have time to do that in the movie, and it's just, like, kind of shallow, like, the characters are fine, but they're not, you don't get the sense of this deep, like, long friendship, and their complete and utter, like, loyalty toward one another, and, like, when one of them starts acting this way, and, like, Abby just refusing to give up on her, like, it was, like, so awesome in the book, and, like, the stakes were, like, really, really high, but in the movie, you didn't really feel that, and that's, like, kind of, like, a shame. So the movie, like I said, it's fine. Um, I got the sense that it was aiming for a much younger demographic, which there's nothing wrong with that, obviously. But I think that the novel sort of transcended that. I think the novel kind of went above and beyond considerations of age or gender or era, like the era you grew up in. Like everybody could relate to it in some way. Um, and I'm not sure that the movie really achieves that same universality. It just seemed like it was very much going toward maybe not even a PG-13. It just seemed like it was just very, very mild. And I just kind of feel like I wish it would have taken more of a stand and put more horror in it and put more into the character development. Even if they'd had to make the movie a little bit longer, that would have been fine too. But like I said, if you haven't read the novel, I'm sure it, you'd probably find it like pretty entertaining. Although keep in mind, like I said, I do feel like it's aimed toward a slightly younger audience, like a teenage audience maybe. But I mean, like I said, not there's anything wrong with that. It just came across as a little YA and I kind of wish they had gone more like the book, you know what I mean? More like the tone of the book, even though the movie has all of the same plot points, but the tone is a lot different. So just know that going in. So, you know, I didn't love it, but it was fun. It was like a fun enough time. I just kind of wish that I could approach it like more open-mindedly, I guess, because, you know, having read the novel and having loved the novel so much, uh, you know, any, probably any movie of it was going to be a disappointment. So I don't want to shit on it too much for that. But, you know, that's how it goes. And it's on Amazon Prime uh, if you want to check it out. If you haven't read the novel and you watch the movie and, you know, I'd be curious to hear your uh, opinions on it because I don't, you know, I can't have that experience, obviously, because I read the novel, like, pretty recently. But I'm curious to see uh, how other people reacted to it as well. So that will do it for this Flickers of Fear, and I will see you guys again on the next one. Bye.